Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, this latest webinar on the Building uh, Business Resilience Series. I think most of you um, know me, but for those who don't, my name is Linda Grant, and I'm a Director of um, Food Projects at Vic Innovation. So today we're going to be focusing on, on e-commerce and particularly the financial aspects and how to make it, um, well, make sure it's a, a pro profitable route to market and, and not just another way to, to spend your hard-earned um, cash. Um, but before we uh, get started, I, I would just like to remind you all that you can Join in the fun. Um, you can use the chat function or the Q&A function for any questions. We are recording this webinar, so we can send that out. Plus, uh, we do have a slide presentation, so it's a slightly different format from what we've used before. Um, we are also going to use the voting um, function in, in a moment um, on, on this webinar. Um, but just to go back and, and give a little bit of context, um, for those of you who have joined uh, the previous webinars, um, you might have been expecting to see um, my colleague John Taylorson uh, chairing this one. Um, so we've decided to actually make him do some work this week. Uh, so he's got to, he's going to be presenting and singing for his supper. Um, we also usually have Hugh Thomas from the Food and Drink World Industry Board joining us, but unfortunately he can't today. Uh, so again, I'll have to sort of give that overall message as to how um, the, this webinar programme came about, but also uh, the Investor Ready um, programme, and, and that really has been driven by the Food and Drink World Industry Board. Um, I think, again, many of you perhaps have engaged with the um, Investor Ready programme. We have a, a team of accountants and food and drink industry specialists who uh, go out and work with food and drink companies, helping them to improve their financial systems, pre prepare funding applications. Um, so, again, if you would like to know more about this, we're very happy um, to, to tell you more. So just moving on to the, the topic in hand, and, and perhaps it's very relevant to be discussing this today when, well, certainly where I am, it is pouring with rain outside. And who would want to go and queue up to do their shopping uh, on a day like today? Um, and whilst I haven't queued to get into a supermarket for, for a while now, probably six or eight weeks, we are Certainly this week, it seems to be we're entering a period of even more uncertainty and concerns. Um, COVID cases obviously are rising significantly again, and there's almost a, a sense of deja vu, I think, on as we're watching what's happening in mainland Europe. Um, we've got localised lockdowns, we've got one, our first one in Wales, and whilst the children have gone back to school, uh, we know that some schools have almost immediately had to send large groups of children home where they've had um, a, a, a positive test. So there's more ongoing worry for working parents. Um, we know that e-commerce became very important during lockdown and, and for all the reasons I've just highlighted, it, it remains a very relevant channel for food and drink businesses to engage in, but do well. Um, we saw what happened in the early days of the pandemic. Um, lockdown and panic buying, consumers very anxious about going out and, and buying and putting themselves potentially at risk. Um, and then obviously for food and drink businesses, they know all too well what happened when food service shut down overnight. So the producers who had some sort of e-commerce um, operation already in place, obviously very quickly switched their focus to direct to consumers, but others then had to start from scratch. And I have to say, personally speaking, I am so pleased that so many Welsh food and drink uh, producers did offer online sales because I think most of my sort of extended family might not have had birthday presents, anniversary presents, if I couldn't have sent uh, Welsh cream cheese, beer, cider, cheese, and of course, for me, gin. Um, 
So to help us um, understand what the market opportunity, I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, Lauren Smith from the Drink Cluster is joining us. Um, she's going to walk us through just what has happened to the channel and um, hopefully sort of point us in the right direction on where the opportunities may um, uh, be for the future. And of course, um, John Taylorson, who will talk about um, the finances and the economics of getting this channel right. But just before I hand over to Lauren, I'm going to launch the poll and hope it's, oh yeah, it is there. So for those of you who've got access to this, um, there's two short questions to answer and then we'll crack on. So here goes. Uh, so if you can answer, nobody seems to be, I don't know. Oh, yeah, a few people are answering, that's good. Uh, I think we're nearly there. 84% have answered, so 89%. Just two more, but maybe they don't have access to a screen. So there we go. I'm going to end that poll now. And I'm going to share this. So, John, you're going to be very interested in the results, <laughs> eh? Uh, can you share, can you see the results? Yeah, yeah so, I can see the results. Yeah, it's very yeah, interesting. 50% sell online. Yeah. 50% um, think the sales are profitable. Um, and then, uh, well, nearly the same number. Well, one yeah. who doesn't, uh, but it, it's interesting. Right, I'm now going to share the presentation. And um, I seem to have gone on to... And hopefully you can all see that. So over to you then, Lauren. Great. Morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. As uh, Linda said, um, I'm Lauren Smith. I work closely with the Drinks Cluster as well. Um, and I'm just going to put some market context on what we've just been talking about. I think Linda summarised really nicely what's been happening with online. Um, we've had just an e-commerce boom uh, since March due to safety, convenience, there's been lots of factors that have contributed to this. Um, but what we are seeing now is that online shopping is reaching a record market share. So in the last four weeks, so the beginning of August, we saw 1.3 billion of online grocery sales, which is a big jump from what we were seeing even eight months ago. Ocado, the online specialist, also hit a new record in August, registering a market share of 1.8%. And then over the last 12 weeks, the beginning of August, saw growth of 45.5%. So this is really big numbers that we're seeing. A third of the total adult population now are spending more than £50 a week on online grocery shopping. And 13% are spending £100 weekly. These, again, these are really big numbers. And what we can see here in comparison to the other sales channels, these are market shares from 2019 and what the forecast looks for 2022. And we can see that online is increasing 7 billion worth of sales by 2022. These are the forecasts. And that's a 59.2% value growth, which is huge. And the only ones that we're seeing come close to that are the discounters, and that's at 25.4%. So if, if this does um, trend in the way that we expect, by 2022, we can see the online market will have 9% share. So this has become, become a very important channel for us to consider and for us to really develop our activity in. Oh. So as well, online shopping habits are changing. So we can see now we've seen what the spend is. We can see... Um, how important it's becoming, but really from a consumer's perspective as well. Since March now, 49% of UK households are doing a weekly grocery shop online. Um, and then since March, that's 2.7 million households that have been converted to online shopping. 
So these, these are big numbers, and we're seeing half of those as well that have been converted between March and June say they will shop more online in the future. So these people that have um, adapted, have adopted shopping online, they're really happy with what they're experiencing, that they want to continue this. It's become part of a habit. I think what we do see is it takes 66 days to form a habit, and we've definitely seen that over the lockdown period. And interestingly as well, we've seen the largest growth um, in online shopping from 55 plus year olds. And this is the group that tend to adopt trends later on. So even the groups that were potentially um, averse to shopping online or were very used to it are now adopting that. And we're going to see a large group moving forward with online shopping and a different group to the, the online consumer that we knew before. Um, sorry, Lauren, just to interrupt there, I think that's really interesting um, uh, about the, the age profile. And, and obviously, as we head into uh, perhaps a, a winter season with fear of infection, you can see actually that group perhaps mm -hmm. is going to be more likely to mm -hmm. keep those habits because they don't want to be going out into, uh, well, certainly queuing up on, on days like today. Um, but also the, the fear of infection. Absolutely, yeah. And as well, I think the second group that had developed, um, that was adopting online shopping after this, was uh, families with households. So for children, or young children, family shoppers. So again, whether we're having um, local like lockdowns again, potentially, as you referred to, issues with um, schools, that sort of convenience that online shopping provides uh, will become more and more important as we head into the, the winter. So these changing habits now are leading the retailers to invest online. They can see that it's a trend that um, is irreversible, as the Waitrose boss says. Tesco, Waitrose, M&S having close ties to Cardo. So this is just going to become more and more important as we go forward. We're likely to see more of the retailers now continue to invest in their online channels. So what we know is online is becoming increasingly important. The strong consumer adoption of e-commerce and the trend is that it's not going away. So the key considerations that we need to be looking at for a good online shopping experience is visibility, availability and desirability. And when we break these down, there are things that you're probably considering anyway, but things that we really need to bear in mind when we're thinking about the online shopping experience. So when we look at visibility, if consumers are shopping, trying to find your product, we need to use appropriate product names. If they're putting into, into the search engine, um, whatever it is, whether they want, um, a certain product of gin, there's no point in calling it um, a special, a special tonic because that's, they're not going to be able to find your product. So we just need to make it really simple for the consumer. In terms of availability, if we're enticing consumers with our promotions, then this will provide a difficult order experience. This will provide an overall poor customer experience. And desirability, we need to carefully consider the proposition and positioning as well online. We need to demonstrate our value. And John will go more into depth with the financial implications soon, but these really are key considerations to bear in mind for the online shopping experience because it will impact heavily on your return on investment as well. Just hop forward a little bit. We can see to really strengthen those availability, desirability, visibility. We need to have these things in place. We need to look at the platform that we're using, whether these are Facebook, Instagram, what's our website look like. We need to make our products uh, desirable as well. It needs to have good supporting graphics, good sales messaging, good uh, commercial positioning, commercial expertise, if we need to incentivize consumers with potential promotions, and also adapt at pace as well. What are people doing? I know, as Linda referred to earlier on in the pandemic, that we're seeing people sending a lot of um, presents to people as well, gifts to help people that might be having a hard time during this time. So adapting to those consumer behaviours will be important. But these things do cost money and they do take time and time is a valuable resource as well. 
So we just need to be really um, savvy about how we do this. So some of the initiatives that we've seen uh, exemplify best practice, um, as I said, work closely with Drinks Cluster. And one of the things that we've seen recently is the importance of collaboration as well, how effective that can be. With Welsh Wine Week, we had at the end of July, this is really to create awareness and drive sales in a really tough period when sales channels had been shut down. But by collaborating, we strengthened that large group voice. We incentivized consumers, we provided different events, different things that were going on, and these were supported by strong communications as well, and utilizing the networks of different producers as well. That's where the, the great aspect of collaboration comes into play, because we can, we can pull on these levers that we all have um, as part of a group. And, and sorry to interrupt again, uh, Lauren, but of course, uh, Welsh Government have been supporting uh, the sort of umbrella messaging, haven't they, with the, the Carrie Cymru um, sort of celebration days, which have been a, a great platform for um, businesses to, to share what they've been doing. Absolutely. And I think across um, social media, on one of the celebration days, I think it was almost trending. So we can see there how the strength of the collective voice can really make a good cut through um, with consumers. And again, as we touched on with the events as well, we've had producers that have hosted virtual events such as online tastings. And this is great because it really connects the consumer to potentially a time that we haven't been able to be face to face with these people. But even outside of that, it helps to promote the, your offer. You can develop and own a story and also create a community around that as well, potentially moving customers or even potential customers along that ladder of loyalty. They can become customers of yours, become advocates, and then that ties all together then. We've got just a continuous circle of both in um, consumers that are really sold on your story and your product. So in communications channels, to really support our online offer, to direct people to our website, social media is a fantastic tool. But we can ask the question, why bother? These kind of can look like vanity metrics sometimes when we look at um, success. But it is an opportunity to start conversations with people. What we do know is that consumers generally tend to do business with people, people that they like and people that they feel an affinity to. So if we can start these conversations with people, that's great to put us on the front foot. We can become front of mind for consumers and engage with our audience. So that we want that if they think of a certain product, we want them, you to be the first people that they think of. And we can really do that by strengthening um, our message through social media. And we can also raise our brand and business profile. We can become familiar within the industry and really have strength around that. But if we think about our communications channels, it takes time, it takes resource to really invest in what we're doing and if we're going to do it properly. And limited time and resource means that we really have to be savvy in our communications as well. So we need to consider how much time can we dedicate to these? Consistency is the key. And if we only have a small amount of time, then we want to do potentially one channel and potentially do it right. If you have a target in mind and you think you can only dedicate an hour to it per week, then we need to stick with that potentially two, two posts a week and then we'll continue with that. But the consumer knows what to expect then and they, you're not potentially um, hurting any expectations. And also, who is your audience? Where are they spending their time? And that's again ties into our return on investment as well. If we know that our, we want to be targeting our consumers, in an efficient way and that's really going to help become how our e-commerce offering become more profitable and again just to give a small example before um john leads on there's a small example of the way that um, the cost implications on social media if we look at the paid advertising aspect i think it can look quite scary on first glance um, but this can be a really effective tool into reaching consumers. And importantly, we can start small. One pound per day is a reasonable starting point to really get to grips with this. 
and we can be very targeted as well. We can reach a specific demographic that we want to reach. So in other ways that potential um, radio adverts or TV adverts, even though they're very expensive, can, you can reach a large number of consumers, but they may not necessarily be a lot of them, the consumers that you want to reach. But the good thing about the social advertising is that we can be very specific about these demographics. Helpfully, we can measure the analytics as well. We really want to know the objectives that we want to set, the measures that we want to measure by, and then we can keep on top of that as well. And if we keep on top of it and we can see success from it, then we can increase our spend if that is effective. And this paid for advertising now can work in, in parallel with our communications and our commercial offers. So we can promote our commercial offers, reach consumers and grow awareness by starting very small with a, with a reasonable price point. So the tip there is that obviously um, for any Welsh gin producers, they need to make sure I'm in their demographic, <laughs> please. <laughs> Okay, I think we're moving on to John then. So um, Lauren's done all the hard work there, obviously, of setting the scene. And it, it's really easy for you now, John, because surely it's just, well, Amazon's there, isn't it? That's the solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, and, I th and Amazon is potentially part of the solution, I think. Um, yeah. Um, just to explain um, why I'm, I mean, go back to 2007, I started a food and drink business from scratch and I had a couple of uh, nice uh, retailers by 2008. By the end of 2008, one of those had gone bang thanks to the financial crisis. So in 2000, January 2009, I noticed that the pre-packed um, from administration retailer was now selling products online um, that... Um, had come out of the administration and we thought well if they can go online perhaps we can so january 2009 we went online with amazon and uh started looking at other retailers and by december 2009 we were outbid for our url by um amazon because they were directing people to go to amazon to buy our products um so i've got a screenshot of it i can show it to people if they want to see it just to prove it the point being that um like this crisis um it was an opportunity for something to go online which at the time for food and drink online wasn't really what people expected so why go online and it is intimidating if you haven't done it before and even if you are doing it it might be intimidating the compelling reason I always give to people is cash up front or pretty soon afterwards. I think uh, Amazon pays out weekly. I think when we were doing it, it was literally fortnightly unless you pressed a button to get that money passed back to you. The great thing about this is that you're the category manager, as Lauren's just been explaining. You can decide who, what the product is, what the price is, what the promotion is that it's going to be about. You're positioning it via the... Um, the different communication channels. So you're doing the who, where, when and why for, for the products. Now, if you're selling to a retailer, you don't get to do that so much. So it does put you in control. And it does mean that positioning using those various channels is within your grip. It also means you can do new product development literally in half an hour. And I mean, you know, this has happened where you say somebody has an idea for a product or a gift set or something for a food and drink product. You effectively put it together, make sure you've got a cardboard box that it can all go in, take a nice picture of it, and food photography is really important. Um, stick it up online, see what people think of it. If somebody says, that's terrible, what are you doing? You say, well, take it down, never happened. But that is part of the problem with the internet because it is very noisy. And you want, as Lauren put it, you want to be able to cut through. So positioning, being consistent and having a planned budget for promotional activity and measuring um, how that goes is really key to learning what works and what doesn't. If we can go to the next slide, please. So, as I always like to say, the internet is all about aggregation or disintermediation. What do you mean by that, John? Amazon is an aggregator. Amazon is really good at getting a lot of people together in one place so that your product potentially can sit on, alongside other people's products and go into their shopping basket as people go by. So they are very much more effective at getting those people together for you. 
Whereas if people come and deal with you directly, that's disintermediation. But they've got to know to come to you directly. And that's the key issue for um, the difference between the two strategies. And there is not a binary choice. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to go one or the other. You can start with one and move to the other or move between them with products. The key thing here is knowing what the costs are of those of going down those various channels and what is appropriate for you. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, now, it's understanding the costs of the, those channels. So for example, you think, well, that's all right. We've got a website. We can, we can make that e-commerce. There is these days a lot of work to be done around ensuring that you've got the right platform for selling your products, that it's secure. Um, so there are some sunk costs and some maintenance costs for your own website to consider. And those sunk costs, you know, the money that you bury into that website that you can't get back again, is only going to be defrayed over the number of products that you sell through there. So you need to be confident that you can attract enough people to get rid of those costs. Versus those aggregators, British Corner Shop, Amazon, Ocado, not on the high streets. Now, these may not be the first place that some people might go for some food and drink products, so it's got to be appropriate. But equally, it could be that you can use a blend of the two. Or, as is happening now, some of the wholesalers who are out there who will take your stuff to the, gen the fine food retail market might also offer you what they call dropship, which means that they'll do some of that fulfillment for you. They'll even put your products up on on Amazon and some of these other sites as well. So there isn't one simple choice, there are many choices, and it's really choosing which one gives you the best margin. So coming back to this theme of aggregation and disintermediation, the real cost here is how do we tell the difference between what costs we have uh, via either channel? So if we just slip on one, one slide, think of it like this. If we build a pallet, we put 400 items on it and we put it into Amazon because we're fulfilled by Amazon, Amazon FBA. That aggregator is going to do two things. One, they're going to get enough people coming past, all those people who've got Amazon Prime who will just slip things into their, um, into their uh, cart. On the other side, you might have to employ people or you might have to stand around, print off 400 individual um, orders, do the postage for them, pick them out, uh, put them together, and so on and so forth. Lots of time that you're not, not always going to anticipate doing, particularly if it's something seasonal and it's a run up to Christmas. And of course, remember, Amazon's got a lot of practice. They've got systems that do all this. Whereas on the other hand, there are potentially 400 opportunities for you to get it wrong. So when we're thinking about the cost we need to think about the real cost of people's time and effort when we go in when we go in go into doing these things now let's just slide on to the next channel that is no different of course to the sort of work that goes into uh, selling on other channels and the key thing here is treating online as a cost center as a separate enterprise in the same way as you might do with something like van sales now we know van sales work for some people and don't work for others, mainly because you don't have enough business sometimes to cover the fixed costs of running that van. And online might be exactly the same. So the point is, is you've got to be able to attribute the costs that are associated with a channel of, of sale and ensure that your pricing and the way that you structure your pricing reflects the real costs associated with that channel. And of course, one way of doing that is to ensure that in the same way as you have ledger codes, the cost of sales that will be in your hopefully electronic uh, zero QuickBooks Sage system, you should have ledger codes for the individual channels of distribution. So a code that says this is going to the retailers, this is the code for stuff that's on band sales, this is the code for the cost of sales for online. So that when it comes to adding up what is working and what's not working, you can attribute the sales and the cost of sales to see what your gross margin is for that channel. We'll move to the next slide. 
What do we mean by that? And I'm sure you're all very well aware of what a gross margin is, but it's really important to, particularly when you do individual products online, to sit down and go, what are the real costs of doing this? And there are three sorts of costs for putting a new product up online, because nine times out of 10, you end up having to do a fresh new piece of cardboard that's going to merchandise or protect this product as it's going to go down that distribution channel. So there's some costs immediately for that. The key thing here is to ensure that you know what costs are attributable to, to online and that you pick up those hidden costs. The transaction charges, it may well be that you've had to pay an additional service to payment sense or whoever it is so that you can do online transactions. Adding all those costs together and making sure that your sales price still leaves you with a uh, gross margin, but also then whether or not you pitch that in the right position. And sometimes people set out online to make sure that it's not easily compared with what else is out in the market. Um, just in the same way as you want to ensure that you're not undermining your clients, your customers out there in the market. So pricing, which is the next slide, is critical. And I know the temptation sometimes for people is to cut the price because they think, and even the consumer thinks, well, if I'm dealing with the supplier directly, perhaps I should be getting a discount. No, and I think one of the things, and Lauren's mentioned this as well, I think, that we've learned from this year is people will pay a premium for the convenience or for you to put together uh, combinations, uh, uh, assortments, if you like, that they can't buy anywhere else. So it's much more difficult for people to, to compare. And the key thing here is to ensure that you've can identify online as that separate enterprise so that you know if it can stand on its own two feet. And sometimes you've got to ensure that the products that you sell don't confuse the customer. I often talk about um, one of the uh, few years ago, we had a, an array of gift sets that we were selling online and we chopped them back from about seven to about three or four, I think. And everybody was concerned that we chopped sales back at the same level. The reverse happened. We simplified our offer. The consumer had less choice, but they actually had some definite choices. Sales were 150% from the previous year. So it actually, a confused consumer very often doesn't buy. So back to Lauren's message about being clear and precise about what your offer is. We equally don't want to upset your other trade customers. So the key thing there is, is to ensure that your trade customers, when they go online, they don't find that you're undercutting them in the market. If anything, this is, a, this is something that can support them in the market. And goes delivery costs, that value proposition that we'll talk about later, making sure that a customer, when they buy online, feels that actually if they pay over a certain amount, they really rather expect the postage to be fl flung in as well. So it's working out what your costs are and at what point you feel that you can afford to absorb the cost of the distribution because somebody has got to pay for it. Okay, next slide, please. Thanks, Linda. So what drives um, the costs? Well, it's not going to come as a surprise that ambient is very easy to do. Um, it doesn't require chill or frozen. But then that comes back to this point about direct or indirect. Ocado are probably a lot better at delivering frozen food than you might be if you were going to set up from scratch. And having something that can cope with um, a yodel driver or others, drop kicking it over the hedge would be really very helpful. And, you know, you, know, a, um, <laughs> you can convert your, your, your sponge cake into an eaten mess very quickly if it's not packaged correctly. And shelf life, of course, is important as well. And one of the things to note is one of the costs that people worry about with people like Amazon is if stuff's hanging around on shelves too long because they, they can start to stray into the territory where you get an additional cost. So having a shelf life is important. Making sure that shelf life means that that product, when it arrives with the, the, the customer, the consumer, has got enough code left on it is important too. But you don't just have to sell physical product. Subscriptions. Look at people like the coffee companies where they've signed people up on subscriptions. I think the wine guys are a good example as well. The great thing about this is that you start to write a revenue line because once you've sold a subscription, you pretty much can rely on that for a while. 
vouchers, pre-sell. I mean, it's even more money up front in a way. So you've got the either the voucher for the gift or the experience or the learning if it's a cookery school or something. So online sales are a lot wider than for food and drink than just the physical products. Okay, thanks. Can we go on to the next slide, please, Linda? There we go. Now, at the risk of repeating ourselves, some of the things here that, that are really important is that uh, allocating time to the sort of things that Lauren was talking about. And, okay, we're talking about the difference between fixed and variable costs. You have the fixed costs within the business for doing promotional stuff anyway. But chances are online requires additional time. Somebody to sit there and do the update of the website for search engine optimization, updating and checking the prices on the online and ensuring that the descriptions are up to date and that any seasonal promotions have been finished and new ones put in place. Ensuring that the code, the amount of shelf life left on stuff that's in fulfillment centers, making sure that anything is getting close to the end that might be incurring cost. There are all sorts of hidden costs here for people's time and effort that you have to um, uh, make time for. But most of all, it's planning promotions and to being able to set them up and run them for a while, be they social media channels or even the price promotions that you want to run on your own website or some of the aggregator websites. Those can be set up weeks in advance, but they need measurement. And literally the first thing I used to do every day was sit down and look at what the sales were every day and compare them with where we'd been um, previously, year on year, month you know month on month season on season and that's critical also for deciding when you can put prices up uh, one of the things i used to upset myself every november was because it was the run-up to christmas and we had a very seasonal product great time to put the price up but i would watch the line to see if it deflected as a result of putting the price up i'd always be upset because the line didn't deflect which meant i could have put the price up higher perhaps so can we go to the next slide, please? These recommendations. Treat the e-commerce business as a separate cost center. Make sure that pricing is right because it is a key way of describing what your product is and where it sits in the market. And make sure that it's not undercutting any retail offers. We talked about the value proposition. Where is it worth putting free postage to encourage those transaction values to be higher? And keep it simple. A confused consumer doesn't buy, and it is genuinely less is sometimes more. A nice, clear, easy or proposition for people to get, remembering it needs to tell them what it's for and when it's for and why it's for. Very important to integrate sales into the bank feeds, if you like, on your accounting system so that the reconciliation for the VAT, particularly sales commission on places like not on the high street, even though your product may not be VATable, the sales commission, the charges for that, you need to be able to identify and recoup those, those, those costs as well. So systems like Xero that will allow you to have bank feeds from the various channels like the aggregators so that you can have the, the feed of the sales that you've done sorted out in Xero and reconciled as if it's a bank account will make your life very much more simple it also means that it's very much more measurable. And then you start to get the confidence that you know where online sales are working for you and where the levers and buttons are to drive it. Because you want to do those sums. What does it cost to sell online? So having ledger codes, as in your costs of sales, identified with an individual ledger code for things that you know are online sales so that you can sit and do that gross margin. But do those other metrics. Average transaction value, either for the comparison with last month, or more importantly, if you've got a seasonal product, year on year, are you making incremental progress? And are you sure that you're not cannibalizing sales from other channels, either as in robbing Peter to pay Paul, if you like, because you've just taken sales out of one channel and switched them to the online? Now, you may need to do that anyway, because as part of your resilience plan, online may be the only way to maintain sales as we've all discovered for some people this year do a forecast 
and budget and allocate time because that is a real time and cost towards this but also it helps you forecast what are we going to sell this year if you get to the run-up to christmas if you're not sure what that budget might be and you've been going for a year or two go and ask some of your suppliers the people who sell you cardboard probably know more about your business than you realize so doing that forecast is critical to make sure you've got the materials in place so that you can sell successfully online particularly if sales blossom at seasonal peaks don't forget customer care lauren talked about this as well but you know we used to have a saying if it goes wrong we have to put it way past right and anybody in marketing will tell you that customer satisfaction equals profitability and it's not to be afraid of a bad review particularly if things have gone wrong and you have put them way past right because if that's reflected in a review that will give your potential consumers confidence that you are serious about online so i think that pretty much sums up per uh, the finance side yeah okay thank you john um i just really wanted to uh put in a, a final slide there um uh, as it says there word about risks and regulations obviously online selling is covered by a number of uh, regulations uh, plus the food standards agency have published guides on selling food or drink online so i would urge people to take a look at those um i as i um said uh, earlier we i think we have some drinks producers listening into this if you're not part of the drinks cluster then uh, please do, I would urge you, there's been lots of support that the drinks cluster have, have been able to, to give um, uh, members. Um, so yes, I would definitely um, urge people to uh, get in contact with Lauren. If people don't have her details, I'll, I'll happily share those. Um, I've stopped sharing my screen now. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, mentor a business. I think we've got somebody um, online uh, who's joined us from Mentor a Business. Um, if they have, if they can raise their hand and um, I can point out who it is at least. Um, but I know Mentor a Business through things like the Trade Engagement Programme have also um, done some training how to get started on Amazon, for example. So again if any of the businesses who are online haven't um, accessed that support by all means contact me and i will introduce you to the relevant people um, in mentor a business because there is great support there so i think the overall message is there is lots of support out there to do this and hopefully do it well um, and and please access that support um, we haven't had any questions come through in the Q&A or chat so it's sort of a, a, a short opportunity if anybody does have any burning questions to um, post those and I'm sure Lauren and John will be happy to answer that. Um, I think one of the areas I just wanted to go back to um, as I say being a, a, a frequent user now of um, Welsh food and drink that I bought online. I have uh, been very impressed, uh, particularly with the businesses who have made use of the box that needs to, you know, go through the yodel test, but how much provenance they've included on that box and really brought the story of the Welsh food and drink to life. And, you know, I am a surprised and delighted customer uh, with that. I knew the quality of the actual product was fantastic, but the whole packaging experience, I mean, the, the family were surrounding this particular uh, item, just unwrapping it and the whole experience worked so well. So I think it's, it's those types of areas, but obviously there's cost to that as well in thinking about that. Um, uh, John, we had a, um, uh, webinar a couple of weeks ago on managing risk. Um, so what are the risks, do you think, of uh, online? Um, I think the, the risks are not as bad as some people perceive. And I think this is something Laura was saying that a lot of people think um, they're put off by 
uh, online because they think that there's the, it, it, it's a potential minefield. I think some basic simple principles are worth remembering. Um, distance selling regulation. As long as you as a consumer can see pretty much exactly what you would have seen if you were looking at a shelf so that um, you can see the size, price, the nutritional statements and any allergens, then from that point of view, you, you should be safe. Um, having appropriate packaging and ensuring that that is robust, that, I mean, that is probably your single biggest other cost in terms of um, the wastage figure. I know we, we spent years trying to get um, a product um, wrapped in such a way that it would, uh, when it was opened, you expect the outer box to be fairly sacrificial, but the internal needs to be something that if somebody opens it up on Christmas day, they're going to be delighted. Mm. So the, th the trick is thinking of it as what it will look like by the time it's arrived. Mm. And just with any other food and drink business, I know we've done this in, in other lives, put a pallet and, and send it to a customer to get them to send it back to see if the pallet, the box is still stuck up. Do exactly the same with your products. Put it in the post to a family friend or something. See what turns up. See if that's how you'd like it to arrive if you're the brand owner. Yeah, good, good advice there. Um, I suppose we really ought to mention the B word and Brexit. Yes, I mean, Amazon have already stated that they won't be doing um, uh, fulfillment across Europe. So immediately um, there's issues about where you can and can't sell online. I think that the trick here is, is to, it's online is no magical mystical world. It's exactly the same as, you know, taking a telephone call, having an order, coping with the currency difference and then posting it out with a customs declaration to wherever it is in the world that you want to send it. The difference is that there will be, and we don't know yet what that will be, there will be potentially paperwork to cover these things. Mm. One of the things that you maybe want to think about is who is taking title to this. So in a way, if you've got a wholesaler who is buying it from you and they are taking title and they are going off to export it, great, as long as you're covered from product liability and that your labeling is compliant with that market, Otherwise, the pallet might be on its way back or the product might be on its way back. So there are there are the sort of normal common sense things that you would do for any sort of export that are exactly the same with online. Making sure that you put in, particularly online, uh, proper sales conditions and terms, terms and conditions on your website to cover off some of those risks is always a good idea. And yeah. that's something we've talked about on other webinars is making sure that you've got those things in place which you should have anyway whether it's export or just selling online in in a, the domestic market make sure you've got your you know your sales and conditions aren't for a ferry firm that doesn't exist in Folkestone yeah. okay <laughs> okay well um I think uh we are probably going to um draw this to a close now there's been no questions so um hopefully people have got a lot out of that I'm going to um, turn the tables on, on you, John, because obviously you always ask our panellists about their top tips. Uh, so I'm going to do the same to you and to Lauren. Um, but as Lauren hasn't had to join one of these before, we'll start with John. <laughs> so what, uh, for e-commerce then, what is your top tip? I think my top tip is um, uh, almost for selling anything. If you want to sell something, try buying it. So before you before you plunge and, and stick a new product online, try buying it. See what the com com competition is. If there isn't anything comparable, then ask yourself, is there actually a market for it? If there is something comparable, make sure that you use your pricing and the way that you describe your products as a positioning statement to make sure that people understand why they should choose your products and what value looks like. Okay, good. Thank you. Lauren, over to you. What's your top tip? At the risk of um, repeating things that have been said before, but essentially to reiterate strongly, start small. I think that's the best thing that you can do. Um, start small and then measure it as well so we can see what's working what's not and adapt and then that'll be the way but you can see what's working grow it into something that's really successful okay well thank you both um 
just before we finish, um, I will also flag up that we are doing another um, uh, resilience webinar next week, uh, same time, same day, uh, Wednesday. Um, we are talking about tax and legal, and I deliberately took a, an intake of breath there, <laughs> thinking, oh, here we go, I'll just watch everybody drop off now um, here. But no, I don't mean to put you off. Uh, we, we know that many, sadly, or unfortunately, many food and drink businesses actually weren't eligible to, uh, for government support because perhaps they weren't a registered um, company, uh, they weren't registered for VAT, they didn't pay themselves through PAYE. Now, some of that support has flexed uh, to allow some, but initially it looked uh, really quite grim. Um, so actually we are going to be arguing that those attributes of, you know, registering for VAT, uh, all of those types of things are not things to be worried about, scared of. They actually will help make your business more resilient. Um, so uh, we've got, uh, we're back to our usual format, I think next week, John, with a panel, hopefully John in the driving chair so I can sit back and have a cup of tea. Um, but essentially, if you're worried about VAT rules, how to apply them, um, if you're not a net beneficiary of VAT, um, uh, this, is, this is the webinar for you. So please don't be put off by tax and legal, um, but we'll be getting that information out hopefully late, later today or tomorrow. So again, hopefully we'll, we'll uh, We'll catch up with some of you again next week. Um, and thank you all for joining. Hey, Chris. There's one great hand. Show the hands, please. Yeah, who's that? Sorry, I'm just trying to see who that is. Chris, Chris Chances. Ah, sorry, Chris. Chris, um, okay, I'll allow you to talk if you have a question. And it comes off mute. Basically, I'm uh, the uh, chair of Welsh Perry and Cider Society, and uh, our members uh, have been having problems with what you've just mentioned. They've uh, quite a few of them have fallen through the cracks of getting any financial help. Uh, so, what you just mentioned now could be an advantage, which uh, I'd like more information on to see if we can actually help them out over this difficult period. Okay, fine. Well, we'll certainly, Chris, you're on our mailing list, so you'll get the information and um, feel free then to circulate it to your members um, and hopefully some of them will join next week. Um, and um, uh, I'm sure John will be uh, his excellent self talking about um, tax and VAT, but with some experts as well. <laughs> Right, thanks very much. Look forward to that. Okay, good. Yes, Chris. Okay, well, thank you all for joining.